The episode you're about to listen to is part of season two series on the body, how our bodies shape our experience and how they both inspire and enable us to create art. Welcome to another episode of Art Heals All Wounds. I'm your host, Pam Uzel. On this show, we meet artists transforming lives with their work. This week's episode is part two of our conversation with filmmaker and performer Julie Wyman. If you missed last week's episode, it's probably a good idea to go back and listen to it before listening to this second half of the conversation. Having been diagnosed at the age of 49 with a form of dwarfism, Julie did get some answers for differences that she had always perceived about her body. She's also connected with the Little People of America, an organization dedicated to improving the quality of life for people with dwarfism while celebrating little people's contribution to social diversity. The availability of new pharmaceutical treatments to make people with dwarfism taller is the topic of this second half of the conversation. Most of these treatments work best if given in infancy, leaving parents with the decision to give them to their child or not. What are the implications for these kinds of treatments? As a society, do we choose to erase difference, or can we become more expansive in terms of including and cherishing our diversity in whatever form it takes? You're listening to Art Heals All Wounds. Listen and let us inspire you. Julie Forrest Wyman is a filmmaker and performer whose work aims to challenge and expand our culture's narrow range of represented bodies. Her 2012 documentary, Strong, tells the story of top American weightlifter Cheryl Hayworth. While being a top performing athletic competitor, with a weight of over 300 pounds, Cheryl defies normal preconceptions of what a female athlete should look like. She also struggles with the reality that the world around her isn't always built for or accepting of someone her size. Julie's other films all deal with themes of difference, whether it's queerness or differences of body shapes and sizes. Her work is helping to expand which bodies are represented and how expanding our very narrow notions of bodies can more accurately reflect the society we live in. Her current work in progress, while still adhering to this goal, is taking Julie into some uncharted territory. As an adult, Julie was diagnosed with hypochondroplasia, a form of dwarfism. For most of her life, Julie was aware of differences in her body. Having this diagnosis provides her with both a way to make sense of this difference and the opportunity to connect with the community of others with dwarfism. It also presents her with the challenge to make a film that is deeply personal and highly collaborative with others in this community. You said another thing, though, that I'm really curious about. Our future is uncertain. What do you mean when you say that? I mean that in the future, some or a lot of little people might look different than they do now. Mm. And that might mean that they look average height, or it might mean that they look like me. There might be more, I don't know if that sounds weird when I say that, but in the future, little people might be taller than they are now, but still have the characteristics of achondroplasia. You know what? There's hundreds of kinds of dwarfism. Mm. There's, I think, over 300 kinds of dwarfism. So I want to make sure I'm clear about that, that the treatments that have just hit the market, there's only one that's hit the market of like, I think eight or so that are in development. And all of those drugs are for achondroplasia, which is one, it's the most common form of dwarfism, but it's one of hundreds of kinds. Mm. And so 
I think that matters just because there's a lot of different kinds of bodies, a lot of different kinds of dwarf proportions, bodies, complications, situations, and not all forms of dwarfism have medical treatments. But what's happening is that the the treatments that exist are now expanding into new forms of dwarfism. They're doing tests to see if they work on other forms. So when I say the future is uncertain, it means that little people in the future may look different. And there's a question about how that will unfold socially. Mm. Like to the extent that there is a community there are communities. There's multiple kinds of communities of little people that connect through their dwarfism. And because they, you know, well, I say they, but I should say we have shared experience, you know, medically, family wise, just dealing with the built world and accommodations and socially and in terms of relationships and everything. So there's a way that there's, to the extent that there are communities of little people for whom our differences connect us, Mm -hmm. there's a question about, A, will we need that in the future, right? Will little people who are taller need that kind of community? And Mm -hmm. will this community dissipate and not be as important? Or there's another question about if certain people or certain, you know, socioeconomic or racial categories who have more privilege are the ones who take these drugs, A, will it shift like who are the demographics of who gets read as a little person or people with dwarfism, but also Will there be new generations of people who fall in between, who aren't welcome into little people community because they've undergone treatment, because they don't have the same challenges or life? And so the future is uncertain in the sense of like, what does our community look like? Who belongs in it? Who gets excluded? And what is it still important? You know, who is it important to and why? Wow, that is... What you're talking about is incredibly complex, and I don't mean to oversimplify it, but it does make me think about, as a species and as societies, are we trying to make everyone be the same, or can we change our society and the built world to accommodate a more diverse population? And I think ethically, an answer floats up of which one seems better to me. But I also think for parents or something who are faced with these choices, it becomes really complicated and really complex about what choice you might make for your child. It's a really complex and honestly, like a bit of a troubling conversation to me. I mean, what are your feelings about that? It's a really complex and troubling and loaded conversation and delicate conversation because I think on one hand, like the individual choices that ultimately parents will be making for their children about whether to prescribe these medicines are so individual and so deeply held and and, and really kind of private, but they're tied to bigger assumptions about the first question you asked about what kind of world we will have and we should, we can have, and we should have. And I think you're exactly right when you say that, you know, these treatments really raise the question of what needs to be changed and what kind of world do we want and what value do we put on both a world where, there are a lot of kinds of bodies and lives and where belonging is, you know, creating places of belonging is the value versus succeeding, Mm. right. And competing. And I think that the reality is that it's very hard to thrive in our world for Mm. in our capitalist world And competition is the name of the game and everyone wants their kids to have the advantages that they can have. And so if they perceive, even if they want there to be a world where everybody belongs, they think, but I don't want my kid to be bullied. I don't want my kid to have to deal with unnecessary challenges that they might be able to 
Um, I don't want my kid, maybe these, we don't know yet, but perhaps these medicines will mean that kids don't have to undergo several surgeries that they might. So how can you not choose that better quality of life for your kid? And I mean, you know, I think one person in, I remember, you know, one clip I have, someone says, you know, the parents who choose these drugs for their kids, you know, ultimately there's going to be a time when they're going to have to say to their kid, I didn't want you to be the way you were. You know, whether it comes from a place of judgment or I wanted you to be, to have every opportunity, but ultimately it is saying, I wanted you to be different than what you were. But at the same time, and, and I mean, sorry, I don't know if I'm speaking in full sentences here, but because it's such a, it's such an unraveling. No, I get it. When I think about, um, I mean, I'm not a parent, so I totally am not in the position that so many parents of, of little people are. And I should also add, because most people don't know this, that 80% of people with dwarfism are born to average height parents. Mm-hmm. And many, many, and probably most of those average height parents might not have any exposure to dwarfism or disability. So it's a whole new world when they have a kid that has a spontaneous mutation that causes dwarfism that wasn't inherited that, you know, and so there's a whole probably reframing of the world and life for all those parents. And I'm not one of those parents. And I just want to own that. But that said, I think that, you know, I can imagine that the choice might be like, what if my kid resents me in the future if I put them on this drug and I'm changing what they are? And on the other hand, what if my kid resents me if I don't, you know, if I had this chance and I didn't take it? And it's so difficult because the treatments only work for for young kids and they work the best in infancy. And so it really is a proxy consent situation where it's not the kid, the dwarf, the little person, the dwarf baby themselves that is making, they're not making the choice for themselves. Their parent is making it. Right. And it would be a whole different story if this treatment could start at age 20 or something, exactly. you know, but they yeah. don't. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, also just thinking about from the person who has dwarfism, their ideas about that are going to change over time. How you feel about it as a teenager versus how you feel about it at 49 is going to be really different. And you're trying to make this decision for them. It's so much responsibility, you know, and all parenting is a massive responsibility and you're making choices every day, right? That have huge impact on your kid, who they are and their future. And, and that's a heavy weight. I think, you know, I'm, I know it is just to come back to the social question, because I think these two questions aren't mutually exclusive. Like they don't cancel each other out because I think parents right now who have babies born with dwarfism or have little kids with dwarfism. Yeah. Probably need to make a choice about, do we want to do this? Do we not? But also, you know, I think everyone needs to like, this is one of those things that influence this other kind of choice about a worldview. And in other words, do we have a world where people become more the same and where we strive towards that narrow model of what is beautiful, what can be successful? Do we reinforce that? Or do we want a world that that doesn't? Uh, reinforce that? And do we want to, or rather, do we want a world that is more, do we want to change the world so that it welcomes and accommodates and expects people of all bodies mm. and values, you know, including people who have chosen or whose parents have chosen to enroll them in these drugs or prescribe or whatever. Um, so, I don't know. I guess what I'm I'm saying is like, but I, I also think worldview that how you create a worldview, how you create the world with your view, it's it's very amorphous, right? I'm walking down the street. It doesn't matter to the world what I care, what I decide, what I've thought. It does matter when people collectively make these decisions. That's what shapes the world. So, mm-hmm. so I get why it's like there's this larger responsibility that parents have right now 
who have kids with dwarfism. And I feel how that can be both, I don't know, really powerful to make choices, but also like, whoa, what a heavy load to have the challenge of making the choice for your own kid and then have to think about how is this impacting the bigger picture? Mm. There's so much to stop and reflect on. I, you know, I, I'm really excited about this film. I mean, I don't want to take up all the time on your episode, but you know that I have similar questions in my life and in my family. And so I'm really excited about this film. And I, yeah, and I, I do sit there and think like, okay, if I- What do you mean? Like, what are the, what ways do you think through that or experience that, those questions? Well, the question, you know, I, I do have a genetic disease that I did pass down. And I, until recently, was pretty much asymptomatic. And I was also adopted. So I had no idea that I had this genetic disease. And then I had a child who had a much more severe case of this disease and or manifestation of this disease. And, you know, within the whole spectrum, she's also quite fortunate. But what would I have chosen as the parent? Because I think about I mean, this is someone who's 27 years old, and I love the person that she is. And it's not 100% shaped by her disability, but that's certainly a factor in there. And I know how she's struggled. There are issues around physical pain, though, which I think would be the one I would really struggle with, because I think as a parent, you never want your child to experience Well, you don't want them to experience emotional pain either. You want your child to sort of live in this perfectly wonderful enchanted bubble and be happy and never go through anything difficult in their life, even though if that happened to them, they wouldn't become a human being. So (laughs) it's just really, it's a really, really challenging question. I know it. it is. And I mean, it's so funny because as you, oh, first of all, I didn't know that whole story so, so much. So thanks for sharing that. And I am wondering, the term disease comes to mind as something to talk about, but in relation to, to dwarfism. Right. But I will, so let me come back to that in a sec, but I, if we have time, but I will say too that um, it's so hard to make these choices from outside I mean, you're not, I guess, exactly outside the situation with your daughter, but like, we want, you know, we want the best for our kids. And yet little people, adults, you know, or like, when I think about myself, right? Like, if I think about what if there was had been this treatment, and I could have taken it, there's, I mean, my gut reaction is like, absolutely not. Like, I am who I am. Everything I think and feel and know about the world is because I have this body, because I have a body that's Mm -hmm. different and it's shaped everything. Like it's, it's, I am nothing beyond what is constituted by like my body not fitting. I mean, I'm not saying I'm not nothing. I'm a lot of who I am and how I see the world is shaped by that experience. And that I think makes me, those are some of the things I like about myself and how I approach life and the world and what I value. But you know, then my wife comes back to me and says, are you sure? Like, are you sure? Just think about that. Like, what if you had had a childhood where you didn't feel that way and where people didn't bully you, where you fit into clothes, where, you know, just like all the things that have been hard for me because of my body. What if those, like, come on, if you could have just not had those. And I have to say, like, there's part of me that doesn't know. You know, that still doesn't know. Like, I I think the takeaway, the the answer is still like, no, I wouldn't have wanted to. But I can't say that there's not gray area with that. And there's like, oh, my God, what if? I mean, I'm sure I would be a completely different person. I don't know who I would be. Maybe I'd be another cool, interesting person. And maybe a lot of things would be easier, right? Like, maybe it would have been really nice to not struggle in some of the ways I have. And I'm just saying, like, I know that my challenges have been a lot less than a lot of little people in in those ways, but, um, and continue to be. But that said, like, yeah, would I have wanted to erase my difference, that difference? 
and what would the cost have been? Like, what have I, you know, gained? And I, t- and a lot of my little people friends, you know, do say that it's like, this has made me the best, the best aspects of me, like whether it's my creativity, my resilience, my like perspective, my way I can see the world. I wouldn't have those things. Right. And I wouldn't have connected to other people that helped me foster like those parts of myself. So. Right. And I do want to clarify, I don't want to um, collapse what I have and dwarfism and say that dwarfism is a disease at all. What, what I have is actually classified as a disease. But personally, I've struggled with that as well. When you have a young, beautiful, healthy looking toddler, I have had people use the term disease and it really it really, I had a real reaction to it. I've had someone else say, oh, I hear you, your daughter is ill. And it's like, she's not ill. She's running around. She's playing. She's singing. What are you talking about? So I just want to really be clear that I'm not saying that dwarfism fits under this umbrella of disease, that this is what I'm talking about is like a really specific thing that is categorized as a disease. But I really react to that. I react to that term even being used it towards certain aspects of your, your own situation or your daughter's right. No, I know. I mean, I guess that's, I just, yes, I just, I didn't, I meant to say, because I think it's an important distinction and it's one of the things that's differentiates dwarfism from certain medical conditions or diseases like whatever cancer or something like that, that is something that's a little more uniformly like, let's try to fix this. Let's make this go away. Whereas, Mm -hmm. you know, dwarfism comes with, you know, an identity, a culture, a different way of looking and being and the different kinds of physiques in the world, which are qualitatively different and not lesser. And in some ways, you know, some people argue, like some people prefer or really value those that are shapes and proportions and, you know, so, I mean, I don't think I'm saying that quite right, but I think it's just important to note that like when parents get diagnoses of their kid having dwarfism, it might be talked about as a, as a condition, perhaps it is, maybe that term works sometimes, but it also comes with like, you know, a history, an identity, it could come with a community, you know, Mm -hmm. if you Mm -hmm. connect your kid to that, which is different than certain medical situations, right? Right. It's something that can be celebrated, in other words, and a source of, you know, like identity and pride. Right, right. And self-knowledge. So, yeah. Right. Yeah. I think, again, though, that's going to be the journey that the individual has to take, because I will take just again, in our family, the journey to sort of try and find a community in the world of disability, as opposed to wishing that this thing was just not a reality. And in one way or another, we all have to take journeys. But I still go back to the idea that for parents, it's really hard to resist this idea that you're not somehow going to make your child's journey much easier. And that's why it's such a challenging question, you know. But then once your child is well on the way to that journey, you wouldn't have wanted them to be a different person. Do you know what I mean? Right. And there's also different ways, just like parents are on parenting journeys too, right? And so there's so many different ways to create support and help and opportunity and the opportunity to know and accept and feel like solid and proud in oneself and also to be aware, to gain the skills to live in a world that might exclude you or underestimate you or misunderstand you. Like those are all ways to create opportunities for kids too. Mm. You know, those are ways to create kids who are part of a world that is built on like belonging and adapt, you know, adapting, encompassing, as opposed to like, you either are with us or against us, you either join, or you are going to be on the outside. It's kind of imagining a more flexible and like more possible, more possibilities of like success and what that means and thriving and what that means. Right, right. 
Well, I told you ahead of time that I was wary of this conversation more about <laughs> because it felt threatening to me than about how, you know, than about anything about the work you're doing. And I'm really grateful that you let this turn into a conversation here at the end and listen to my experiences. Yeah. I mean, I hope, <laughs> I hope that feels okay. And like, I hope that, I mean, obviously you, you get to choose what goes in your, your podcast, but it's really interesting for me to think about those kinds of parallels and just, I mean, that's to me in some ways why this situation, I mean, sometimes people I've been filming with are like, you know, this, this is just a, we're like, you know, it's what people always say, no pun intended. It's a small world. It's like a neat, you know, it's, a, it's, there's not that many people in the dwarfism community. And yet, like, I do think these like themes and challenges and questions that are coming up are like so relatable from so many kinds of experiences of, of both parenting and even not like even navigating our way in this world that makes it hard <laughs> to not fit in, you know? Right. So I'm glad that it, I mean, I'm in a way I'm like, oh, I'm, I'm sorry that some of these questions like can push buttons, but I'm also not sorry because I feel like it's, it's kind of what makes it valuable. I hope, you know, no, this is something that beyond ideas of dwarfism or even disability, these are questions that because of where we are scientifically right now in medicine, that we have to grapple with. And you can grapple with these issues through many different ways. And this is a really rich one, a rich entryway into thinking about it. There's so much more I wish we could talk about, particularly about implications for different socioeconomic, you know, implications and things like that. But I'm not going to keep you all day. But I would love when you get further down the line, I would love for you to come back and talk more about process, like how... That would be really great. That would be exciting. I, yeah. I would yeah. totally be happy to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, the content is really, really rich and thought provoking, but the way that you're going to do this, again, opens up so many possibilities in terms of documentary filmmaking. So it's exciting. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. Thanks so much. You're listening to Art Heals All Wounds. Thank you so much to filmmaker and performer Julie Wyman for being a guest on this two-part episode of Art Heals All Wounds. If you missed part one of Julie's interview, I hope you'll go back and listen to it now. And if you want to find out more about Julie and her work, you can go to her website, IamJulieWyman.net. That's I-A-M-J-U-L-I-E-W-Y-M-A-N.net. You can also learn more about her films by looking her up on the Internet Movie Database by going to imdb.com and typing Julie Wyman into the search bar. The beautiful music used in the opening of this show is by Ketza. The music you've heard in this podcast is Yellow Light District and Otto Waschenlage Instrumental by Lobo Loco. Beethoven's Piano Sonata No. 15 in D Major was performed by Karina Galanian. This episode was edited by Eva Herstova. Thank you for listening to this episode of Art Heals All Wounds. If you're enjoying this podcast, please let us know by giving us a five-star rating in Apple Podcasts or Good Pods. If you're feeling extra inspired, leaving a review, letting us know what you're enjoying about the podcast is always very much appreciated.